Good evening. Good evening and good evening. Welcome one. Welcome all to I Am My Sister's Keeper. I am your host, Miss Terry Penny. Thank you for joining me today on this beautiful Thursday, this beautiful snowy Thursday. Um, I hope you guys are having a blessed and wonderful day. I know that I am. It's, um, it's, it's been a good day for me. I hope it's been a good day for you guys. I hope you got out to enjoy the day. Um, I know that some of you guys had some good weather, some good snowy, well, we have some snowy weather. Um, it's been snowing all day here, so, you know, that that's okay with me because I'm, I'm in the house. I am in the house. Um, I don't know how it is for my people in Louisiana. Uh, I hope you guys have been blessed. I hope God has carried you so far through this day and blessed you with your daily needs. I hope he woke you up in your right frame of mind with a song in your heart. And in peace in your life, I hope that he has shown you that it's always better and brighter than the day before. Remember that. We don't need to bring the things that happened yesterday into our new day. Those things are in the past. Some of us make our day doom and gloom because we always bring our past with us. So let's try and leave it where it is. We may have sorrow, but joy comes in the morning. Remember that. So, I'm excited today because we are going to uh, start part two of the, the study sheet. Y'all know we was getting into it yesterday. And, uh, yeah, I'm telling y'all, it's, it's not enough time. When, when we get to study and everything, it's not enough time. Two hours is go by so quick. So, we're going to go ahead and we're just going to go before the throne. And we're going to ask the Father to, uh, come and join us. Him and our big brother Jesus and... My big sister, the Holy Spirit, we're going to ask them to come on down and join us so we can go ahead and we're just going to go on and get started because, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of learning to do and I, I want us to get the majority in because we it's, it's just time go by so fast, don't it? Especially when you get into it. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne to say thank you. Thank you, Father, for waking us to see this beautiful day. Thank you for watching over our families and our homes and protecting us from the seen and unseen. Thank you for blessing my brothers and sisters around the world with their necessities that they needed to get through today, Father, and through life. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you, Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who came down upon this earth and who gave his life on Calvary Mountain just for us. Thank you for your gift of the Holy Spirit that walks with us. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity and chance to once again teach your words to your children. Father, we ask that you and Jesus 
and the Holy Spirit come down once again to sit with us as we dive deeper into your words. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit once again just take over the Bible study like they, like she always do. Father, I ask that you hide me behind the cross. Don't let them see me. Don't let them hear my voice. But Father, that you and your son, or you are your son, come teach the class as usual. So that they know that it is the truth that is coming from your mouth and not mine. So that they know that these things are being said by you. So that their spirit would connect with your spirit. Father, I ask for all those who are hearing, watching, and may watch later. That when they hit that play button, that the Holy Spirit will connect with them. That they will continue to watch the video until the end. Father, it's so much that you want to teach us, but so little time that we have. So I thank you for this opportunity to learn what it is that you want us to learn. And to do the things that you need us to do in order for us to be with you in paradise. Father, I pray that this be pleasing and acceptable to you. And I pray to you this prayer. I ask these things of you, Father. I declare and decree all things. I seek your face in your kingdom because that is where I want to be. Thank you for answering and hearing our prayers and cries. In your son Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay. So we're just going to get right into it. Now what we left off is four things that Jesus knows about the church of Pergamos. Okay, we talked about yesterday was Jesus' description of himself and the four things that he knew, well, the first part of the four things that he knew about the church, and that was their works. Now, we're going to talk about the circumstances under which they labored. It says, I know where thou dwellest. Even where Satan's seat is, where Satan dwelleth, there's a number of possible meanings and things this refers to. To say the least, it wasn't a good situation under which they lived. The temple of Escopolis or Ascalith, Ascalephus, a pagan god whose idol was in the form of a serpent. Israel also fell prey to the same in a sense. A bronze serpent that Moses erected as a means of salvation, which Jesus was a type of. Numbers 2 and 9, John 3, 14, 16. Israel later worshipped. Ezekiel later destroyed. 2 King 18, 4. The altar of Zeus. This is now seen in eastern Berlin. This refers to the evil influence Satan had there. It refers to the satanic power and influence of the city. Any and all types of idol worship is demonic at its very core. Yes, let me mark that. Listen to this again, y'all. It says, I know where thou dwellest. 
even where Satan's seat is, where Satan dwelleth, Revelations 2.13, part B and E. There's a number of possible meanings and things this refers to, to say the least. It wasn't a good situation under which they lived. The temple of Asclepius, a pagan god whose idol was in the form of a serpent. Israel also fell prey to the same in a sense. The bronze serpent that Moses erected as a mean of salvation, which Jesus was a type. Numbers 21.9 and John 3.14-16. Israel later worshipped. Hezekiah later destroyed, 2 King 18.4. The altar of Zeus. This is now seen in eastern Berlin. This statue is now in eastern Berlin today. So that means you still can see this. This refers to the evil influence Satan had there. It refers to the satanic power and influence of the city and all types of idols worship is demonic at its very core. Now, here's a little tidbit that I don't know if you guys knew or not, but it's new to me. One of the sons, Jephthah, Noah's son. Him and his family migrated to what is now known as Russia. And when they was talking about Gog and Magog and Tubai. In fact, let me turn to that. Because it's in a chapter that we haven't gotten to yet. But I was studying it Saturday. And it, it was, I'm like, really, what? Oh, yeah. Okay. So it was Abraham's, not Abraham, sorry, Noah's son Jephthah and his family that migrated into the land that is now known as Russia. And Jephthah's son are the ones that are mentioned as like Magog and Gog and um yeah I'm telling you it when you read you learn some things so let me let me tell y'all where that well I can't tell y'all I'm sorry I can't tell y'all until we get there. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to talk about it. Okay, let me get back to where I'm supposed to be at. But because it had Berlin in, in, in the the printout, that's why I... But I'm, I'm not supposed to talk about it. Okay. So it says, 1 John 5, 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. 
Acts 17 30 says, and the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Listen to that again. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. It was a time that, you know, people didn't know what this was. But see, now we know. We know what idolatry is. Now he's saying you need to repent. You, you know what this is. You know what you're doing. You know that it's wrong. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 9 says, For they themselves show of us what matters of entering in when we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Listen to that again. For they themselves show of us what matters of entering in we had unto you. And how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They went from serving idols, the believers, to serving a true God. The saints, the, the, the true believers of today, we went from doing things of the world to worshiping things of this world to putting our trust and faith in things of this world repented was washed clean transformed Received salvation, picked up our cross, walked with Christ, and now we serve and worship him. And now we are that, now that his light illuminates in us. We are to be an example for those that wants to follow but don't know how. We are to be an example for those who are still lost in the world. We are to show them that, hey, if he can change us, He can change you too. The only difference between us and them is, is they have to want to change. They have to want to be born again. To live right. To give up the worldly life. They have to want to walk away. From the idol worshiping. The fornication. The pride. The vainness. Because if their hearts. If, there's, if God is not in their hearts, if there's no love in their hearts, if there's no belief in the cross in their hearts, how can they change? The seat of the Roman government is another thing that Jesus knew about the church of Pergamos. The undefined allusion to Satan's power. Satan had a strong foothold in this city. 
God knew that. Jesus knew that. They were living in the seat of demonic activities. A stronghold of Satan himself. How many areas, cities, states, countries, and the world does Satan have a strong seat in today? Okay, there's the question. There's the million dollar question. Let's ask that question again. They were living in the seat of demonic activities, a stronghold of Satan himself. How many areas, cities, states, countries, and the world does Satan have a strong seat in today? Satan is called God of the world. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, Prince of the world. In John 14, 30. Prince of the power of air. In Ephesians 2 and 2, in 1 John 15, 19, the Apostle John said, We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the grip of the evil one. Satan is the prince of of the air that means he can go to and fro heaven and earth heaven and earth he can go back and forth in fact he can go back and forth now he ain't gonna be able to do that for long but he can do that now. But we are the, it, well, I'm sorry. John says, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the grip of the evil one. We must first bind the strong man, Mark, 327. Now, y'all know that I'm circling all of the reference verses. Okay, just so you know. All of this will be put in at the end. If we are going to plunder his house, this world over which he rules, this is particularly true in seeing people rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. Colossians 1.13, this is what was taking place in Mark 3, 14 through 15. He appointed 12 so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons which Jesus himself had been doing listen to that again we must first bind the strong man if we are going to plunder his house we must first bind Satan if we're going to bring the people out of darkness. This world over which he rules. Because remember, this is Satan's world. 
Hey, big brother. I sure will. Okay. Uh, excuse me one second, y'all. I have to look up something for someone. of the power of A. Okay, big brother, this is for you. And I'm going to put some, uh, reference verses in there for you. Church. Uh, 
All right. It says. I need to mark where I read it because I get thrown off. Okay. Ephesians. Ephesians 6, 12 and 13 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality against power, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. 
You know what? That's not where I was. I was explaining the top. Okay. See, I got thrown off. Okay, it says, oh yeah. We must first bind the strong man if we are going to plunder his house. This world over which he rules. Okay, that's right. We must first bind Satan if we are to lead God's people out of darkness because Satan is over this world. This is particularly true in the in seeing people rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. So if we are to be that beacon of light that's going to lead our brothers and sisters out of Satan's clutches, out of this world, out of the darkness and lead them to Jesus Christ who can lead them to God's kingdom, who can adopt them into the family. Then first we have to bind Satan. That means that we have to cast, get him out of our lives. We have to, we have to repent. We have to cast aside this world and everything in it. We have to, to leave everything and everyone, everything and everyone that is not of Christ alone and leave it where he left it. If Christ purges us and cleanses us and take everyone out that is hindering us, then let them stay where they are. Don't go back and pick them up. Because he took them out for a reason. He left them where they are for a reason. It says, this is what was taking place in he appointed 12. When he chose the 12 disciples to walk with him, he was preparing them. For an assignment. And that was the two by two. When he sent them out. To different. Cities. To preach. To heal. To cast out demons. To tell the world. About him. And like he said. If they came upon a household that did not want to hear, that was rejecting them, to dust the feet, dust the dust off their feet and keep moving forward. Don't carry that with them. They were told not to take extra clothing, no extra nothing. He was preparing his disciples to be like him. Just like today, he's preparing his disciples to be like him. In order for us to draw his children out of darkness, we first, before we do anything, we have to be right in our hearts and in our minds with him. We have to have a relationship with the Father and his Son. And the Holy Spirit has to be in us in order for us to go out and draw others. Because we can't do nothing if we're not right. How are uh, how is a non-believer going to go and draw another non-believer to Christ? We first 
have to become believers. We first have to repent of our sins and pick up our cross. We have to learn to love ourselves before we can go and love someone else. Because if we have all this garbage and, and mess of the world and, and, and all this, this sin in us, then how is God going to be able to do his work in us? I mean, how is he going to be able to do anything in us? His disciples... Got to go and do some miraculous things in the world. They touched the lives of a lot of people. Today's disciples are doing the same thing. We are touching the lives of a lot of people. And those that are coming to Christ, that are walking with him, that are Learning, loving, and living for Christ or changing the lives of their husbands, their wives, their children, their families. And now they're going out and discipling to others. It's the ripple effect. It started with one. One. And he gave his life on the cross. And is Satan happy about that? No. No, he's not. He's not happy at all. Because we're meddling in his business. We're meddling in his business. But see, God knew that the enemy was not going to be happy. He knew that he was going to throw everything up against us. That's why he gave us the suit of armor. It is the 
This is Ephesians. Verse 13. Ephesians verse 13 says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. Because of what we face. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day refers to resisting the opposing the power of darkness. That means that we won't fall back into worldly things that we just got out of. We won't fall back into the temptation because Satan is going to try and tempt you to come back to him. He's going to tell you, this is just a phase you're going through, baby. This is a phase. You, this, come on. You you know you was much happier over here gambling and, 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 and sexing and drugging and, and doing your thing. Come on back up. You, you don't need to be over there. You, you don't need to be sober. You, when you're sober, you think too much. When you're not high, you bored. You you can have all the women and all the men you want. Come on back over here. Ladies, y'all know y'all like being with these ladies over here. Come on, they come on, fellas. I got some men over here that'll wet your will, so come on. That's Satan. But you tell them no. I don't need that anymore. I don't want that. I don't desire that anymore. My desire is to please the Father. My faith is in the Father. So he, the Father knows that the Satan is going to do this. So this is what he gives you to protect you. And to have... And having done all to stand. This refers to the believer not giving ground, not a single inch. Stand therefore, this is verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girded with truth, the truth of the cross, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, which comes strictly by the by and through the cross. 15. And your feet showed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Peace come through the cross as well. 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Every ever making the cross the object of your faith which is the only faith God will recognize and the only faith Satan will recognize. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. This represents temptation which Satan assails the saints. Everything he throws at you, you have that shield of faith to protect you. 17, and take the helmet of salvation has to do with the renewing of the mind, which is done by understanding that everything we receive from the Lord comes to us through the cross and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God is the story of Christ and the cross. The Holy Bible. That glorious book of wonders and miracles is your sword. Study. Studying, spending time in the word, digging deeper, learning more, meditating on the words, being fed the words by an anointed one. 
these. This is your suit of armor. This is what you wear into battle when you going to going into a rescue mission. See, you cannot go into a spiritual battle buck naked and nude because you're going to get beat down. But when you go in there and you have on that suit of armor, you ready for battle. And the love of God, that the love that you have for your brothers and sisters is that light that's going to illuminate, that's going to shine so bright in that darkness. That it's going to throw them, them, them demons off guard. It's, it's going to blind them. Because they don't, they don't know what love is. They can't comprehend love because they, they have no love. When you show a brother and sister love like they have never had before, it throws them off because they never had that. They never known that. And when you keep showing it to them and keep showing it to them and keep showing it to them and keep treating them the way they're supposed to be treated and keep helping them and keep feeding them what they need to be fed. First, they're going to question why you're doing it. Then they're going to wonder why you're so happy. Then they're going to wonder what's wrong with you. Then they're going to start feeling a certain way when you're around them. They're going to start missing you if they don't see you. They're going to start noticing little changes in their lives. Then they're going to Want to know, they're going to want even more of what you have. And then sooner or later, they're going to want more and more and more until they get so hungry that they can't stop. They, they, they're going to keep wanting and keep wanting and keep wanting. I'm going to add this, um, in there also. In fact, I'm going to add it all the way to verse 20. So I just added a little extra for y'all. Matthew 16, 18 through 19 says, Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose on heaven. In heaven. Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When Jesus Christ brings his people, his church, and plants them upon 
this earth, Satan ain't going to be able to touch us. Do you hear? When Jesus come and gathers his church, which is us, not the building, which is us, Satan won't be able to touch us. When he has bound Satan and all his followers here on earth, all of those that are in heaven are going to be bounded too. When all the saints and martyrs are freed on earth, they will be freed in heaven. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done upon this earth as you may have it in heaven. Whatever you have done up there, let it be done down here. Upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18 and 19. King James Version says, And I say also unto you that you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The commentary for that verse and I say also unto you that you are Peter. The Lord changed his name from Simon to Peter, which means a fragment of a rock. And upon this rock, immovable mass, Jesus, the living rock on which the redeemed as living stones are built. For other foundations, no man lay. Oh, there's another... Let me write that in there. There's another reference verse for you kids. I will build my church. The church belongs to Christ. And he is the head. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The power of death caused by sin shall not prevail against it, which victory was won at the cross. 19. And I will give unto you. You refers to all believers. all believers the keys of the kingdom of heavens of heaven refers to symbols of authority 
the privilege of preaching and proclaiming the gospel, which is the privilege of every believer. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Christ has given the authority and power to every believer to bind Satan and his minion of darkness and to do so by using the name of Jesus. Ooh, more. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Loose loses the power of God according to the usage of the name of Jesus. This is the authority of the believer. We would have the power to bind the enemy and all of his followers on earth and in heaven. We will have the power to preach and proclaim the gospel, which we have now, to preach and proclaim the gospel. Some of us just don't do it. Some of us rather just don't do any, nothing with our gifts. We we just don't want to do nothing at all. Period. We it it's just we just let it go to waste. That's that's what basically that's we 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 took a gift that was given to us as a blessing. And just chunked it back to Christ and say, there you go, I don't want that. That's, that's, and that's kind of a, a, kind of sad because you didn't even give it a chance. You didn't give him a chance. You just figured, no, I don't want this. I, I don't want this. Three. They held fast his name. I know that holdest fast my name. Revelations 2, 13c. My name an embodiment of personal faith and loyalty to Jesus and his name. It refers to faith in him and his name. A new wife take on the name of the husband and counts it an honor and privilege and badge of honor to have his name. So it is and should be for every child of God. They were not ashamed of his name, but carried his name with pride. I have a crown on my wall that says, Terry, a child of God. I'm going to show y'all. I'm not ashamed. I never have been. And I never will be. Just so y'all know. Because like I told y'all. I don't have no problem showing you. See it right there? 
Make sure y'all can read what it says. Terry, a child of God. That's what's over my head every night. I'm not ashamed of them. I claim them. I'm honored. I'm proud. That's who I am. I am a child of the living God. That's who I am. That is who I serve. That's my father. My king. I am the daughter of that man. My brother died for me on the cross and rose again. My sister, the Holy Spirit, walks with me every day of my life. How many of you walk? With his name. How many of you walk in pride? How many of you walk honoring him? That's your father. How I, how can you not? You know, I see people. Walk around with tattoos of people's names all over them. All different kinds of names. But you don't see too many people Saying, I'm a child of God. I'm the son of God. I'm the daughter of God. I'm. Because they have the fear that if they tell somebody that they are, that they're going to get laughed at talked about, bullied, and you know what, I mean, that, that don't last long, because you know what, let them laugh, let them say what they want to say, let them, if, if they feel they want to be, let them. Let them, because remember, that same one that they're laughing at, that you are claiming, who name that you have taken on, it's the same one they got to stand in front of come judgment day. That's the same one that they have to, they don't know it, but it's the one providing them with everything that they need. See, that's how I look at it. If, if people sit up there and, and, and judge me because of who I am, well, that means y'all judging the one that made me. And that's not, that's not a good thing for you to do because... He's the only judge that I know. 
And if you're judging him, then he's judging you. So, I mean, if you for team God, then baby, you be for team God. You shouted from the highest mountain to the lowest valley. You shouted to every and anyone who wants to hear it. Who cares what the world thinks because the world can't do nothing for you. You shout it. You be proud to shout it. In fact, I shout it louder than anybody out there. Oh, well, you know, I, I it's probably got some people whose mouth is a little bit louder than mine. But I be shouting right along with them. So, yeah, saints, believers, stop hiding in your shells. Stop worrying about what the world thinks about you or how the world feels about you. You worry about what God thinks because that's what's important. You sit up here and keep worrying about what the world thinks, baby. You ain't gonna, you're not going to make it. That means you done took your armor off. Some way, somehow, Satan done got in there and, and, and penetrated your armor. You, you need to get it repaired. Plug into the source. Get recharged, rebooted, revived. It says, they boldly proclaim his name in the midst of the world in which Satan ruled. That's right. His name is to be professed among all who have called upon him for salvation. We hold his name dear to ourselves. We confess his name at the salvation of our souls. But it doesn't end there. Our confession and profession of him and his name isn't to be a one-time thing. It is something that should and must be continual. We hold his name out for all to behold and to receive as we have. Every day, all day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a week, every minute, every second, every hour. We are never to stop confessing or professing the name of God, the name of Jesus. Love it, live it. Romans 1 6 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first. And also to the Greek, Matthew 10, 32, 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever, y'all listen to this, look, listen to this last part. But whosoever shall deny me before man, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Those who proclaim Christ in front of man in this world, who go out and preach the gospel of Christ, to man in this world. Those who stands up to this world and confess 
and claim the name of Jesus Christ who claim as to be a child of the living God when it comes time to stand in front of him he will not deny you before the Father because you did not deny him before man. But if you know him and you did not confess or you did not acknowledge him before man, you kept him to yourself, you worship to yourself, you preach to yourself, because you were too afraid of what the world was going to say or do to you. When you stand before him. He going to say leave me. I do not know you. You denied him before man. He going to deny you before God. Philippians 2, 9 and 11 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, what? Every knee shall bow of the thigh in heavens, the thighs in earth, the thighs under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me read that one one more time. Y'all, that, yes, I, listen to this again. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. There is no other name above Jesus Christ. That at the name of Jesus, every knee, that means every animal, every human, if the trees can bow, they will bow. Of, th of things in heaven, of things in earth, of things under the earth, and that every tongue should con I don't know why I said thighs. I'm so sorry. Y'all, that, but, uh, y'all, when I get excited, I got to learn how to, when I get excited and, 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 I'm um, baby, I have to learn to slow down because my words do not come out right, and they, I told y'all, they just pile up on each other, and they just start Excuse me. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I need to underline that because that is like my ultimate favorite, favorite, favorite verse. Oh, I love that verse. I love it. Hebrews 3 and 6 and 14. It says, But Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence of, and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Question. Whose house are you? Are you a part of God's house? Y'all know where I'm going with this. 
Who house do you belong to? Philippians 2.16 says, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yeah. Hold forth the word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Four. They had not denied his faith. This is another thing that Christ knew about the church of Pergamus. They had not denied his faith. It says, and hast not denied my faith, even those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelled it. This refers to the body of the fundamental truth of the Christian faith. To stand true to the truth and doc doctrines of scriptures even when engulfed by evil all around you. They stood strong for sound doctrine and biblical teachings, even where there is falsehood all around. They stood strong for sound doctrine and biblical teaching, even though there were falsehood all around. They stood for truth, even when there was an, an apostasy in their ranks and faced with the temptation to compromise. These people were in a church that was divided. You had the believers and the non-believers mingled together in one place, side by side. Looking at each other's face every day, all day. No walls separating them. They walked amongst each other. They intertwined. They intermingled. But yet they had to look at each other, knowing he's a pagan worshiper. He's a pagan worshiper. He's a believer. He's a believer. He's a believer. How can I get them to come back to Christ? How can I get them to come? How can I get them to worship the emperor? To worship the Roman goddess. To worship Zeus. Can you imagine the chaos that was going on in there? As they were sitting there going back and forth trying to figure out how to convert each other. If there was ever needed this kind of steadfastness for the truth, it is needed in our... Oh, here we go. Talking about us now, kids. Talking about us now. It says, if there were ever needed this kind of steadfastness for the truth, it is needed in our day. We live in a day where truth is being compromised like never before. 
Yes, that is so true. False doctrines and erroneous teaching abounds in our day like at few other times. Ours is days is a day where those are needed who will stand for truth and sound doctrines. Pastors need to be about the business. Pastors need to be about the business of teaching sound doctrine to their people so they will be less likely to be carried away by strange doctrines. Let's circle that. Pastors need to be about the business of teaching sound doctrine to their people so they will be less likely to be carried away by strange doctrines. Pastors needs to teach the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Pastors needs to teach the true words of Jesus Christ. Pastors needs to teach God's given words to his children about his son so that they can be protected from the wiles of Satan and this world. Pastors needs to stop teaching from their knowledge of what they have learned from when they grew up and what they heard and what they think they know and from their own understanding and start teaching from the Bible that was meant to feed God's children what they needed to protect them from the world. Pastors need to take time with the Father in their quiet place, meditating so that they can receive their sermon from Him and the scriptures that they need so that they can feed His flock 
the message that they need to get them through that week. Pastors need to be about the business of teaching sound doctrine to their people so they will not so they will be less likely to be carried away by the false teachings by man's doctrine by made up information by leaning on your own understanding by, I'm going to tell you what's going to make you feel comfortable teachings. By strange doctrines. By Satan's false prophets. Second Timothy four and one four one through three says, "I change thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke." Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure the doctrine. With, I'm sorry, we're not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves. Teachers having itchy ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. It's going to come a time where those who were appointed to teach the truth, who were put over God's flock to lead them to salvation. It's going to start wanting to teach what they want to teach. Who's going to start giving you comfort food Instead of salvation food. Who's going to be swayed from the gospel and start teaching worldly doctrine, doctrines? What it says, Second Timothy 4, 1, 3. It says, Who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in, a, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, Shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. God does not like it when you take his words and turn it into your own. He don't like when you paraphrase. He don't like when you... Uh, Tweak it. 
He don't like it when you take it and 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 to to make it less harsh or or less stinging or or what's the word I'm looking for, Father? What's the word I'm looking for? Less truthful. You take his words and make it less truthful. You take out important key words that his children need to know and insert words that makes it okay. God doesn't give us okay words. He give us words to help us to understand that if you don't stop, if you don't repent, this is what's going to happen. If you don't do this a certain way, if you don't act a certain way, this is what's going to happen. But if you do this, if you act like this, if you carry yourself like this, if you follow my son like this, if you hang in, if you hang through it and make it to the end, this is what you will receive. Trials and tribulations. The trials and tribulations is going to show a lot of people just what your pastor is made of. We're going to see how many pastors are going to stay true to the word. How many are going to sit up there and say, okay, y'all don't panic, don't panic, it's going to be all right, it's going to be all right. And, and, you, and, and you know, if you go do this and if you do it like this and, and, and if you just, it's going to be all right, we, we're going to be fine. We're going to see how many pastors are going to stay true to this word. We're going to see how many are going to actually say, repent of your sins. Turn from the wickedness of this world. Go out and preach to others what God is. Go out and help those who are in need. Go out there while Satan is out there doing his thing and, and tell these people, get out there and, and, and do what God has asked, been asking you to do all this time when none of this was going on in the first place. All this money and stuff that you got hiding, all this food that you got put to store, everything. Get out there and do what you should have been doing. Let's see if they're going to tell you all that. Let's see if they're going to tell you to open your homes up to the homeless like you should have been doing in the first place. Let's see if they're going to tell you to get out there. Why do we sit and procrastinate when we know that we're not living right? Why do we sit and procrastinate and then when things start going left, we panic? Don't panic now. Don't get scared now. It was told that it was going to happen. You had a choice to pick up your book and start reading this. You had a choice to get up there and preach and teach these people what God said. You had a choice to do this. You chose to give them comfort instead. Now, where is that comfort going to lead them? And 
Instead of telling them that if they don't read, if they don't study, if they don't pray, if they don't repent, if they don't live the life that Christ had for them, if they don't start loving their brothers and sisters, if they don't start living the Christ life now, when things start going left, and your ducks aren't in order, and you still living in sin, you still living that comfortable life, What kind of comfort, pastor, are you going to give them when they beating your door down to come after you? Because you didn't tell them, where this 100-pound hailstone coming from out of the sky? What, what is these things that's biting us and leaving all these sores? Why is all these people dropping dead in the streets? What, what you going to tell them? Preach the truth. Not what you want to preach. Preach God's words, not your words. First Timothy 4.13 says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Titus 2.1 says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Speak the truth. Tell them the truth. It's up to them to decide what to do with it. But long as you told them the truth, you did what you were supposed to do. Stop lying to these people. Stop lying to these people. Yeah, stop, stop lying. Stop, stop it. Just stop it. What is the purpose of you lying? I don't understand that. You'd rather send millions of people straight to hell for what? You going with them. You're the cause of them going to hell. Ephesians 4.14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the, excuse me, by the slight of men, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. I'm going to read that again. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive as children, believers, and saints. If the Holy Spirit is in us, if Christ lies in us. We know when somebody is not telling us what we need to know. We know when we're being lied to. Because the Holy Ghost is going to let us know. We're going to get that feeling in us that's like, oh no, this is not right. This is not right. Nope. Nope. 
No. Mm-mm. No. You gonna challenge that pastor. You gonna want to know, excuse me, where did you get your information? Can you please show me in my father's book, where did that come from? I need the Bible verses. I need the chapter and I need the book that that came from. Can you show me? I don't want to see it on no laptop. I don't want to see it in your phone. I want you to get the Bible and show me where that came from. Because, bro, if you can't show me in the Bible where that came from, you no, you ain't got to worry about me coming here no more. Some of us will sit in a building With someone who's been on television, who done wrote books, who got money, blase, 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 and don't have God nowhere in them. But will sit there and be hung on every word they say. That is the same for the non-famous churches. We will sit there and get fed garbage. Hebrews 13, 9. Yeah, we are not children. We are not children. So, stop acting like we are. Hebrews 13 and 9 says, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. If they tell you that, no, that is honey mustard to you, and you taste it and it's mustard, then it's mustard. If they tell you that the sky is gray and the sky is blue, the sky is blue. If they tell you, thus says the Lord, and you said, no, that's not, no. If they can't tell you where it came from, no, it's not. Saints, children of God, believers in the true Christ. Stop like you stop acting like you don't know the difference. God did not make dumb people. People just act like they dumb. You know the difference. Adam and Eve wasn't dumb, sweetheart. They just acted like it. She knew she wasn't supposed to eat off that tree. But that she just act like she was dumb because she wanted to eat off that tree in the first place. 
That's the desire she had in her heart because she wanted to taste that fruit. And hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelt. Antipas means against all. A symbol of faithfulness against all that came against him, even to death. He may very well have stood alone and the entire church is commended for it. Would we stand alone even when everyone else is caving in? That's a question. Would we stand alone even when everyone else is caving in. You know what? I'm going to put that in the comment box. Sure is. In fact, let me put that in. I'm going to put that in right now. Right now. Sure is. Watch. 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 That's something for you to think about. we stand alone even when everyone else is caving in feel free to answer that question in the comment box it said that's exactly what is required in our day if we are going to take a stand for sound doctrine we very well may have to stand alone against all. All that is coming against us, against all odds, and against a, a midriff of false and erroneous doctrines. We very well may have to take such a stand one day soon. We will take such a stand a martyr is a witness. He wasn't a martyr because he died, but died because he was a martyr. He stood for Christ. He would not deny Christ. No matter what they did to this man, no matter how much they tortured him, he did not deny his faith. He did not deny Christ.
Wow, Father, you really want me to ask that question. You really want me to ask that question. Okay. How many Judas S. Crack, S. Carts, or how you pronounce this man's name, are in the world today? If Jesus Christ will walk this earth right now and people sought to kill him, how many of you will betray him? I can't believe you had me ask that question. You seriously had me ask that question. You think they really gonna answer that? What Jesus had, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What Jesus held against them. Now, this was the complaint that he had. He said, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So thou, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Revelation 2, 14 through 15. One, those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, Numbers chapter 22 through 25. No, I think I used this one already. I don't think I'm going to give you all that one again because I think I used it. I'm going to have to get that other sheet out and compare it when I put y'all other, um, yeah, I'm going to have to do that. It says, Balak, king of Mo Moab, saw all that Israel did in the, did to the Amorites and sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor saying, look, A people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. Therefore, please come at once. Curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you blessed is blessed. And he whom you cursed is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee. Numbers 22, 5 through 7. Balaam sought the Lord about what he would have him do. And God said, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people. 
for they are blessed. Numbers 22, 12. He told the mess. He told the messengers to return to Balak, and Balak sent messengers again, who were more honorable and more money, silver and gold, etc. This time God allowed Balaam to go with them, but the Lord was not pleased that Balaam persisted. Mm. Beware. There are times that the Lord will let us have our way. Listen to that. There are times the Lord will let us have our way if we persist to our dismay. Yeah, when we're impatient, we can't wait on them. We want to do things in a hurry. We 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 just we 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 need it done. You're not moving fast enough for us. We we have a better way of doing it. Your way is not giving us the results we need. So we come up with a better idea. So you know what he does? He steps out the way. He lets you go and do what you're going to do. But he's still there. He, he going to let you try it your way. Since you, you know, were so persistent and adamant about it, you go right on ahead. I'll be right here. I'll be right here. Once God has clearly told us no, we must not persist him, persist against his will. If we persist, God will often give us what we want, but we will be walking contrary to him. And he will set his face against us. Listen to this again. Once God has clearly told us no, we must not persist against his will. That means we, we don't challenge his no. If he says no, then he's telling you no for a reason. He must know what's going to happen. Well, he knows what's going to happen. He's God. So he's doing this, telling you no for a reason. Trust and believe in what he say and, and, and just go with it. If we persist, God will often give us what we want. Like I say, he's going to tell you, all right, well, since you so adamant about it and you want this so badly, you want to do it your way, you want to be in charge, you know what's best for you, you are just on top of your game, go for it. I'm a, go for it. Go you go do you. But we will be walking contrary to him, and he will set his face against us. Mind you now, he'll still be there. He will still be there. But He'll be focusing on someone else. He'll still be there. But his attention will be elsewhere. You do you. You said you want. You don't need my help. You don't need my advice. I told you no because this was a bad idea. But you want to persist and keep doing it and keep challenging me on my authority. Like I don't know what I'm talking about. So you go ahead and I'm going to go. And help your sister. I'm going to go help the one that's willing to listen. You go ahead. Go ahead, baby. Go, go ahead. 
Balaam persisted because of his greed. He wanted that silver and gold and that money. He desire was not for money alone, but for the power, the honor, and prestige that would be bestowed upon him. So if he went and he did what the king asked him to do. Then they was going to look up to him. That was going to boost his ego. Ain't that what we be looking for when we get out there and do stuff on our own? We look for the. Oh, yeah. You did that. You did that, girl. Yeah. Yeah. You took that. You did that. Mm-hmm. Look at you shining. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Look at you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Got oh girl, you went out there and you you got that. You you took that job, huh? Yep. Gave you a little power. Now you can tell all these people what to do. Gone got in your head. Yep. Now you done got a little privilege. You got that big house now. All right, look at you with the fancy clothes. Look at you, girl. <laughs> Decked out, looking all cute and stuff. Yeah, I've got to get the hair and nails done now. Yeah, look at you. Look at you. Look at you. Look at you. We must guard ourselves against wrong motives. See, Balaam was doing all of this for the wrong reason. Just like today, we do things for the wrong reasons. If we desire to proceed even in doing the right thing because of a desire for money, power, honor, prestige, our motives of contra are contrary to God's. Well, see, if I do this, then I have the power to build this and build that and do this, and then I can do this for everybody. And then I have more money to get this done and get this done and get this done so I can build more for to do this for people and everything. And then that'll give me per, more prestige so I can meet more people that will be more who will invest in what I do. So they will invest more money to build more of this so that I can get more pe You see what I'm saying? You're doing it on your own without God. That, that's you, You're working against him. That, that, that's no. That is what Peter was dealing with when he said, feed the flock of God which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not by filtered luc lucre, but of the ready mind. First Peter, whatever. First Peter 5 and 2. If we will do the right thing, speaking and doing all that God has appointed us to, with only the desire to serve God and his people, God will take care of us. Listen to that again. Balaam was only doing this for power, honor, prestige. And money. He persisted. That God let him do this. But for all the wrong reasons. Even if we wanted to do something for the right reasons. And God said no. And we persisted on him letting us do it. It's still wrong. But if we do it. And it is to 
What again? To serve God's people? To serve God? Then God will take care of us. Let God's people also be aware. When God's man is serving with the proper motive and working diligently to give us his words, it is his people's responsibility to make sure that they are well taken care of. Hmm. When we serve God and his people, God will take care of us. And how will he take care of us? Through his people. It says the worker is worthy of his support. Matthew 10 and 10. And again, the elders who ruled well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while. While he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Read also Romans 15, 26 through 28. 1 Corinthians 9, 7 through 11. Oh, I got some. And Galatians 6 and 6. I got some homework for you guys tonight. So God is telling us that if we serve him and serve his people and preach his words diligently that his people, his workers, will be taken care of. We won't have to persist in doing nothing ourselves because he's going to make a way for us to be taken care of. And the way we're going to be taken care of is this, through the people that we're helping, through the people that we're teaching and preaching to, Do you do let me ask this. Let me ask this. And then I'm gonna let y'all go. I'm gonna let y'all go. Do y'all ever notice that when one of God's servants, his true anointed pastors, are speaking on the pulpit? And they then got up there, and I mean, they have preached a fire message. They can go in the Bible and tell you exactly where their message came from. They they have they have spoke they have spoke fire over you. I mean, you can tell that the 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 message came directly from God above because the atmosphere in the Building changed. 
You could tell the Holy Spirit was in there and that God and Jesus had then took a seat amongst his people. And it was like this from day one up until now. The church has grown. It has grown so much to where it is outgrown the building. The community service has outgrown the building. The food pantry has outgrown the building. To the point where the pastor and the congregation has come together and did a three-day fasting. And is asking God to bless them with a new building to accommodate the masses that is now filling it so they can continue to grow. They, they're not asking for a time frame or anything. All they're asking is that when he's ready to bless them, could he bless them with a building. And they're cheerful givers. Oh, my goodness. They don't mind. See, that's what happens when you're being blessed with the word. You don't mind giving. And it goes on for like this for another two, three, four years. I mean, wall to wall, pack to pack with people. Bible study. Men's study, women's ministry, men's ministry. You know, they have young people, young adults ministry, children's ministry. I mean, the fire is, the Holy Spirit is so inlaid in that building that if you walk in there, you it, it's going to knock you out. And then, here it is, 4 o'clock in the morning, 4 a.m. And the pastor is awakened out of his bed. Hits the floor on his knees, almost giving himself a concussion because he almost hit his head on the, end of the, on the side of the end table. Hitting his knees, crying, falling like a baby because God didn't answer him. In a vision. He wakes the wife up. They get dressed. They get in the car. And they go three blocks over from the church. And what do they see? A building. That just came up for sale. Two minutes after midnight. And they go and they call church members. And people are going to work 5 o'clock in the morning wondering why all these people are standing around an abandoned building. Praying. Worshiping. Thanking God. That's because they did not persist or, or pressured God into hurrying up 
to give them another building. They asked him, but the time was not right. So he told them, no, for right now. They endured. They kept preaching. They stayed faithful and steadfast and waited on him because they knew that he knew when was the right time. They kept preaching. His doctrine, they didn't falter from it. They didn't start doubting him. They didn't start preaching falsely. They didn't start acting like he didn't exist anymore. They stayed faithful. That fire that was in that church from the beginning was there four years after they asked him. It was still there. They were still connected. They still believed. They still stood up against the world. They still kept battling Satan and the and, and the enemy and all his minions. And the flock was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. When they finished praying... Over that building, that when daylight hit, a bid was put on that building, and that became their new church. What once held 1,500 can now hold up to 4,000. What he said, if we will do the right thing, speaking and doing all that God has appointed us to do, with only the desire to serve God and his people, God will take care of us. Let God's people also beware. When God's man is serving with the proper motive and working diligently to give us his words, talking about the pastor, it is his people's responsibility to make sure they are well taken care of. The pastor was properly taken care of of by the people of the church when he got that vision in the middle of the night his wife got up and the congregation met him at the church and they prayed over him and they prayed over And when daylight hit, God answered their prayers, and that became their new church home. It says, the worker is worthy of his support, of their, I'm sorry, the worker is worthy of his support. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So, if you have a pastor who's bringing you that fire, Who, who's stepped into their anointing anointed assignment and is doing what they are supposed 
supposed to be doing, and that is feeding you God's words, you're going to see a difference in that church. You're going to see the fruits of their labor. You're going to see that building grow because the church is going to grow to where it's not going to be able to fit in that building. Not decrease, not get empty, but it's going to increase to where it won't be able to fit in that building. That's how you know. That's how you know that the word is being preached and taught. In God's house. Because. God is. Woo. Pastors of today. Step into your anointing. Stop running and hiding from it. Stop stepping into it for the wrong reason. Stop stepping into it for the power and the prestige and the fame and the the four, wait, wait, what, what is it? Power, honor, and prestige, and money, and retirement. That ain't what God called you for. He called you to feed his children. Man is not your bread. Jesus Christ is your bread. We're going to stop here tonight, y'all. And tomorrow, we will finish up the rest of the study guide. I'm going to put in the Bible verses that we did tonight. Y'all got a lot. Y'all have a lot. Y'all got a lot. Um, let us go to the... Oh, yeah. Let us go to the throne. And we're going to thank our Father for this... Heavenly Father, we come before your throne to say thank you. Thank you, Father, once again for you, your son, Jesus Christ, and my big sister, the Holy Spirit, for joining us again tonight for another impactful learning Bible study. Father, I... I, I, I just don't know what to say about y'all three. Y'all just. Y'all something. Holy Spirit, thank you for coming and just doing what you do best. Showing up and showing out once again. Big sus, you just, you on a roll, girl. <laughs> you on a roll. 
Jesus, I want to thank you once again for just coming to teach this Bible study and just mm. and dad, I just thank you for just being here. We just you like the calm before the storm. I pray that this has been pleasing and acceptable to you all. Thank you for using me. Thank you for this assignment. Thank you for just allowing me to do this. Father, I am forever your servant and a servant to your children. I am your daughter. And I am a child of God. And I carry your name with pride. And I just, all I want to do is just make you happy. That's it. And to let your children know that you're, you're, you're legit. You're legit. And you're nothing to be played with. And I love you guys. I love you guys for your honesty and your 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 straightforwardness and your bluntness. And I, I'm so glad y'all made me like that too. Thank you so much for attending. Father, I ask that you be with my brothers and sisters tonight as they spend time with their family, their loved ones, and their friends. I ask that you continue to bless them with their daily needs. I ask that you be with my brothers and sisters who are in faraway countries and lands. Be with them, Father. Give them strength and courage that they need to stand up against their oppressors. Father, I ask that you just watch over each and every one of them, both near and far, as they lay their heads down to rest tonight. Watch over our families and our friends, our homes, Father, and protect us from the seen and the unseen. Father, thank you again for awakening us up to see another beautiful day that you created. As we get ready, Father, to end this Bible study, I ask that you give traveling grace and mercy to all those who are on the highways and byways, Father, that they respect and look out for each other. Father, I just, I am grateful and thankful to you. I honor you. I give you the praise and the glory. And I worship your holy name. I lift up your kingdom, Father. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And I look forward to you joining us tomorrow. Father, I pray to you this prayer. I declare and decree all things. I ask these things of you, and I seek your kingdom and your face, Father, because, yes, this is where I want to be. There's no other place that I want to be. Thank you for answering our prayers, and thank you for hearing them. In your son Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Until tomorrow, guys, good night. Y'all, I want to thank you guys for joining me tonight. Know that God loves you. He always has. He always will. Know that no matter what you guys go through, no matter what the situation is, no matter what the world throws at you, no matter what your friends, your loved ones, it, 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 no matter what the storm is, 
Know that joy comes in the morning. And that all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus. And he will reach his hand out to you and pull you out of that pit that you dug yourself into. And know that Miss Terry loves you guys to the moon and back. I will see you guys tomorrow at 4 o'clock where we will do part 3 of the study guide of the Church of Pergamus. There will not be a Bible study on Saturday because that for me is the Sabbath and I will be spending time with my father and my big brother Jesus and my big sister Holy Spirit. That is our day. I will see you guys Sunday, and we will do the, um, <laughs> we will be doing the summary for the uh, Church of Pergamos. Because, like I say, this ran long. This church ran long. And that's okay, because... I told y'all, some, some of them going to run longer than the others. And to be frank with y'all, Pergamus is not the only one. Because the next church we are going to be doing is Thyateria. And Thyateria has 29 verses. So that's going to be even longer. And on top of that, yeah, so... Y'all, I'm, I'm going to do it the way he told me to do it. He said, there's no time limit. So there is no time limit. So I will see you guys tomorrow. Y'all be blessed. Y'all be safe. Y'all have a good night. Enjoy your families. And I will see y'all tomorrow at 4 o'clock.